Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. I'm your host, Holly Spear. This is Kate Carter. And I'm Kylie Colwell. And if you have not listened to last week's episode, stop, pause, go listen, because this is a part two to part one of the lipstick killer. And if you don't listen to part one, you're not really going to understand much of part two. So go do that and then come back. I love that. Uh, Part two is after part one. Just making sure everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. One comes before two. Yeah. And two is after one. So. Oh, now it's getting confusing. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) I will say, I feel like you guys should be proud of me. I did listen to part one while I was gone. Listen to it on the plane on the way back from my work conference. And good job. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, even though I told you to go listen to part one, I'm still going to give you a pretty detailed recap just because I need it as well. It's been a week. I've slept. So here is part two of The Lipstick Killer. In part one, we recounted the terrifying disappearance of six-year-old Suzanne Degnan in January 1946. Her father, Jim, had already gathered the ransom money. He was desperate for her return while police scoured the neighborhood for clues. But as we know, this case would soon take an unimaginably dark turn. As detectives searched near the Degman home, they found disturbed dirt around a manhole cover. Upon investigating, they made a gruesome discovery. Suzanne's head was found floating in the water below, her body dismembered and discarded in the city's sewer system. Investigators found her legs and torso scattered in various locations, wrapped in bags and debris, though her arms were not recovered. This brutal dismemberment was carried out with precision. Investigators received more than 3,000 tips and conducted over 300 interviews and 170 polygraphs. While pursuing these leads, the FBI matched two fingerprints from the ransom note to a known suspect. In February 1946, two utility workers would discover Suzanne's arms in a sewer three blocks from her home, suggested that they were discarded later than the other body parts due to their better preservation. By June 1946, five months after Suzanne's murder, police apprehended 17-year-old William Hirons while he attempted to break into a different house. Hirons was a student at the University of Chicago, and his fingerprints were the match for the fingerprints found on the ransom note. A search of his dorm revealed stolen items and disturbing possessions, including surgical tools. Obviously, this led to his arrest for the murder, but not just the murder of Suzanne, two other murders. Along with other victims were 43-year-old Josephine Ross, a stay-at-home mom who was horrifically and brutally murdered in her apartment in 1945, so prior to Suzanne's murder. This murder was unsolved. Her daughter found the horrifying, chaotic scene and discovered Josephine's body covered in blood and bound. Witnesses described a dark-haired man fleeing the scene shortly after the murder. Investigators initially focused on Josephine's acquaintances, including her boyfriend, Oscar. Oscar had an alibi. Next, they focused on Chester Rice, who had a criminal background, but he also had an alibi. As the investigation continued, the police faced mounting pressure to solve the case, leading to rushed arrests, questionable interrogations, and media-driven assumptions. The search for the killer intensified after the murder of Suzanne Degnan and Josephine Ross. In the wake of these brutal crimes, police learned that on the same day as the Degnan case, the FBI arrested a fugitive named Lawrence Gates in Chicago, suspected of burglary. However, this lead quickly dissipated when police ruled him out as a suspect, leaving no solid leads. In December, another tragedy would strike when 33-year-old Frances Brown was brutally murdered in her Chicago apartment. Frances was a beloved stenographer who had previously worked for the military during World War II. It was discovered one night that her apartment was ransacked, with her body horrifically displayed in the bathroom. Similarities between her murder and Josephine Ross's case were alarming, 
Both women had been stabbed and their heads wrapped in clothing, and both crime scenes had been cleaned up by the killers. Francis's body showed signs of defensive wounds, suggesting a fierce struggle. The investigation into Francis's murder was marred by media interference, with reporters trampling the crime scene and uncovering the killer's chilling message written in lipstick on the wall. For heaven's sake, catch me, before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Dubbing the murderer the lipstick killer. Police found a single bloody fingerprint at the scene, but struggled to establish any strong leads. A doorman reported seeing a nervous man leaving the building shortly after the murder, and police, suspecting a possible female assailant, stated that they had not ruled out the possibility of a woman being the killer due to the nature of the lipstick message and the lack of sexual assault on the victims. With the connection between Josephine and Francis' murders, police feared that they had a serial killer on the loose and all eyes turned to William Hirons, who was already in custody for his alleged role in Suzanne's murder. A handwriting test revealed he misspelled the same words, the same words that the killer did on the lipstick message, further linking him to the crimes. Despite his fingerprint match and the handwriting similarities, police could not secure a confession, even after using sodium pentanol or truth serum during his interrogation. It was during this that he claimed it was actually his alter ego named George who was responsible for the murders, which the sensationalist media eagerly reported, weaving fictional narratives about his mindset and the crimes. Amidst this frenzy, a witness came forward claiming to have seen a man matching Hiram's description near the Degman home on the night of Suzanne's abduction. Public outrage grew as details emerged about the brutal killing and the murder of a little girl, resulting in pressure on the police to solve the case. On August 7, 1946, Hirons confessed to the murder of Suzanne, Josephine, and Francis. But during the reenactment of Suzanne's murder, he claimed not to remember the events. He eventually accepted a plea deal receiving three consecutive life sentences, seemingly concluding the tragic saga. However, the story would take another turn when Hiron recanted his confession, claiming innocence. His supporters scrutinized the evidence revealing inconsistencies, especially regarding the handwriting analysis. Before Hiron's arrest, a handwriting expert doubted the ransom note and the lipstick message were even from the same person. The expert, Herbert, later testified that the writing matched Hiron's, but prior to that, another handwriting analyst was fired for claiming the opposite. This revelation sparked new questions about the validity of Hiron's conviction and whether the true identity of the lipstick killer remained hidden in the shadows of Chicago. As the investigation into the murders deepened, questions about the integrity of the police procedures and the evidence began to emerge. There were suspicions that William Hirons had become coerced into changing his story. Not only did his confession come under scrutiny, but the circumstances surrounding it raised red flags. Some speculated that financial incentives might have influenced key testimonies against him. Furthermore, Hirons claimed that when police asked him to write the phrase found in lipstick, they instructed him to misspell it, to spell it like it was written, leading to the same errors found in the note. There were also whispers that a journalist might have even planted the lipstick message in the first place in a desperate attempt to score a sensational story. Hirons' confession was clouded by the history of police brutality as the same officers who had tortured another suspect were now interrogating him. He alleged that he was denied the right to speak to his parents, deprived of sleep, and he was not allowed legal representation. During his six-day detention, he endured severe mistreatment, including being tied to a bed and having alcohol poured on his privates. Most disturbingly, he underwent a spinal tap without anesthesia, a procedure that caused him significant pain and led to further trauma especially since he was recovering from a head injury sustained during the interrogation. During this time, Hirons took a polygraph test, which he passed, though the results reported to the media were falsely stated as inconclusive. The police, in a controversial move, administered sodium pentanol, or truth serum, against his will. This substance, which induces extreme drowsiness rather than compelling truthfulness, led to Hiron's confession about an alternate personality named George, a name that he used because it was his middle name. A doctor who administered the drug later testified that Hiron's never confessed while under the influence, but the transcript of his testimony remained sealed. 
the fingerprint evidence that seemed to solidify Hiron's guilt also came under scrutiny. Experts noted that the fingerprint found at Francis's apartment only matched Hiron's prints at a nine-point level, far below the FBI's minimum threshold of 12 points for a match. A six-point match would fit about 65% of the population, casting further doubt on the relevance in implicating Hiron's. Despite having a minor criminal record for robbery, no stolen items were reported in any of the murder cases, raising questions about the police's narrative. After being sentenced to three consecutive life terms, new evidence came to light suggesting that Hirons may not be guilty after all. And that is where we left off on part one. So now you're all caught up in that not so short summary. It was definitely needed just to give like a little bit of a recap too, because there was a lot going on in that first episode. Yeah, there was a lot. So would it interest you to know another man actually confessed to the murder of Suzanne and not confess like he got tortured and then confessed like our other suspects? This man was named Richard Russell Thomas. And Richard was 42 years old and in jail before William Hirons was even arrested. He was awaiting to be sentenced after he was convicted of sexually abusing his daughter. Thomas was actually having repeated nightmares, and I guess he just snapped and randomly confessed to killing Suzanne a year earlier. At the time Suzanne was killed, Thomas was working at Woodland Hospital in Chicago, and on January 7th, he told his employer that he was feeling ill and that he needed to leave work. This is the story that he gave. So he did that. And instead of going home because he felt ill, he actually was going to rob someone, which he claims that he did this periodically to make some fast cash. So he picks out the Dagnan house because he says it looked like he would find money or jewels in there. Richard said that he planned to use the ladder, but he apparently remembered that he had a master key for many different types of locks. And he decided to try the door. And this one fit the front door of the home. So he says that he actually just unlocks the Degnan's front door and walks through the house. He said he passed Suzanne's room and he watched her sleep. He had come for some quick cash, but he thought he could make a lot of money off of kidnapping a child. So he wrote a ransom note on a small scrap of paper that he had in his pocket. Thomas claimed that Suzanne did not wake up when he picked her up or when he carried her out of the house. He carried her down the street when she finally woke up and started screaming. Thomas got scared that she would draw attention to him, so he covered her mouth until she stopped screaming. He had probably killed her at this point, or she had at least passed out. He dropped her body into an open coal chute at that apartment complex, and then he slid himself down the chute. Now he's in the basement. This is where he dismembered the body using surgical tools that he had brought with him. A handwriting expert would say that there were major similarities between Richard's handwriting and the ransom note found in Suzanne's room. In fact, experts said that his handwriting was even closer than that of William Hirons. And I don't know how much credibility that I give to handwriting. I understand that there can be similarities, but I just don't think it's, in my opinion, something to hang your hat on in an investigation. Like, either way. I think I can see the difference between some people's handwriting but if you're asking someone to write something like you see it or write something I don't know I just feel like and I always figured if the police have like evidence of with handwriting on it and I'm brought in and I know I'm guilty I would write completely different I've always exactly. thought about that I mean I think that it would probably be more reliable if you found something that someone had written years ago or weeks ago and compared that but when you say like hey write this i'm not i'm not writing how i usually write for sure and also i don't know about you guys but personally my handwriting has very has changed drastically over the years and also my handwriting is never the same like i could write two sentences and it would look completely different it just yeah. depends on how I hold my pen. What I, I don't am I sitting in a different position? Like, what kind of pen I have? Right, like it's I have always a favorite different. Pen. Am I writing on a sticky note or am I writing right. on like a huge piece of paper? Like it's so different. Today I went to go vote, and when you are voting in person, they ask you to 
try to copy your signature on your driver's license to the best possible that you can. And I literally looked at the guy and I was like, this isn't going to be good. And he goes, just give me one letter that looks the same. And I was like, it's still not going to be good. Yeah. I didn't know they did that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how much I put into that. But anyways, they said that the handwriting of Richard was more similar to the note found than William Hirons was. So take that for what it's worth. But the main problem with William's story is that by this time, police had already settled on William. Richard gives this ultra detailed and matching confession, and police were already on their way to Arizona to interview him, but then William became the main suspect. They started feeding information to the press that William was the killer, and then they just never went back to Richard Russell Thomas. Thomas had a previous conviction for kidnapping and extortion and was in Chicago at the same time that Suzanne was murdered. So Richard gives this detailed confession just days before William is arrested, and conveniently, days after William was arrested for the murder, Thomas recants his story. So, I mean, yeah, why would you not, like, recant your story if you're guilty and then they just arrest somebody else? I don't know. I feel like because he was already awaiting sentencing for something if he gets involved into another investigation that might delay things for him yeah and that's kind of what police are thinking and that's how that they're able to just kind of dismiss this and forget about richard thomas and i mean i do think that it's possible that police know more than we do and maybe it's really not him and he's just saying that to delay his sentencing or try to get a better deal which i don't know how that would ever happen because you you have like a charge of assault and then murder and why would you confess to murder but i think that's totally possible that it's not him i just think that the police didn't do their due diligence in seeing if it was him no i'm not buying that he walked in the front door and like happened to have a key that matched yeah I mean, I don't know much about, like, master keys to things, but that sounds really odd. Yeah, and then, because they're not a wealthy family, right? Like, No. If you're going to, he apparently picked it out because he thought there would be jewels and money in there. I don't, I feel like there'd be other houses to rob. Definitely. But any suspicions of Richard were lost in the hysterics of William's arrest. And before too long, the public, seemingly the police, had long forgotten about Richard Thomas. We all know that we don't always know what the police know, and we know that people falsely confess all the time, but Richard's definitely a person that should have been looked at a little bit harder. And it's probably not going to surprise you to know that there are some armchair detectives that have some theories of their own. And one of these theories involves the unsolved case of the Black Dahlia. Oh, ever heard of it? (laughs) Yeah. So for those of you who don't know it, I'll give you the Spark Notes version because this may or may not be on one of our future lists on OMDP. But um, anyways, so the murder of Elizabeth Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, is one of the most infamous unsolved cases in American history. It's the brutal death of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short. It's haunted and intrigued the public for decades due to the violent nature of the crime and the mystery surrounding it. Elizabeth was originally born in Massachusetts, July 29, 1924, in Hyde Park. She was raised in Medford, near Boston. She was one of five daughters, and the Shorts were a middle-class family, and their lives were typical, until Cleo Short, the father, abandoned his family when Elizabeth was about six years old. Cleo left behind an unfinished letter, and his car was found abandoned near a bridge, leading authorities to believe that he had committed suicide. And this is what everyone thought. That is until a few years later, when he resurfaces in California, where he's found alive and working. So this is obviously a shocking revelation for the Short family. Mourning your father's death, like thinking he was dead for years, and then he turns up like, straight chilling in cali you know i'd be pissed i'd be yeah. like I'm just, you're never you're not you're not coming back in my life it was so easy to abandon your family back in the day just scoot out and go live another life anyway so 
When Elizabeth was a teen, she loved movies and she was very fascinated with Hollywood. She had big dreams of being a star one day. Elizabeth suffered from chronic bronchitis and had to have lung surgery as a teen. So her mother would send Elizabeth to Florida for the winters for her health. So it's like, I'm guessing just because bronchitis, you usually get in the winter that like she sent her to live in Florida during the winters because of, because it's warm. Yeah. That was a common cure for illnesses. Yes. <laughs> that Arizona. Yeah. Okay. I will say, so like just giving you an example, Holly, um, Christmas last year was 72 degrees, I think. For those that love that, Florida is a great place. I mean, I know that Florida's hot. I just mean like I didn't think about like people with like lung conditions that happen more in the winter time going to Florida for the winter. I guess I just I never wouldn't have either. I mean, it makes together. sense, but I wouldn't have thought about that. Yeah, yeah. But it makes sense. So it was here in Florida that Elizabeth got a little bit more independence. She was able to stay out with her friends a little bit more than she would in Massachusetts. Also, in her late teens, Elizabeth started connecting with her father again. She actually moved in with him in 1943 in California. But, unfortunately, this didn't last long because her father had developed kind of a transient lifestyle and their relationship grew tense. So, Elizabeth moves out. After this, she would kind of just hop around traveling back and forth between various cities in California and Massachusetts. She found work as a waitress and a clerk and occasionally a model, all while still hoping that someday she would get to achieve her lifelong goal of acting. Her movements around California often placed her in contact with servicemen as World War II had made the state a hub for military personnel. Because of that, in 1942, Elizabeth became engaged to Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., an Air Force officer that she met while staying in Santa Barbara. But this would only last three years because in 1945, he tragically died in a plane crash, leaving Elizabeth devastated. Some accounts suggest that she continued to seek male companionship, partly out of loneliness and partly to support herself, which earned her a reputation as a socialite. Friends and acquaintances described her as outgoing with an unmistakable look. She had pale skin, jet black hair. She was glamorous and had a very sophisticated wardrobe. She often dressed in black, which some speculate influenced her name as the Black Dahlia. Elizabeth's work in L.A. was marked by financial instability. She struggled to find steady work. Friends recall that she rarely had a permanent address. She would often just stay with acquaintances, couch hop, back and forth. At the time of her death, January 1947, she was living in the downtown L.A. area trying to make a break into the film industry. The morning of January 15, 1947, Short's body was discovered in a vacant lot in the Lima Park area of L.A. The discovery shocked even seasoned detectives as the nature of her death was exceptionally gruesome. Her body had been severed at the waist in such a precise manner that it led detectives to believe that the killer had to have medical or surgical knowledge. The worst part is that her face had been slashed from the corner of her mouth all the way up towards her ears, creating a smile. And the body had been completely drained of blood. Not just like she was bleeding from the murder, but purposefully drained of all blood. The body was also scrubbed clean and was carefully posed in a spread eagle position. The corpse was left in two separate pieces. There was no sign at all of any blood at the scene, suggesting that she had been killed elsewhere and transported to the parking lot. So just imagine this gruesome, gruesome scene with a body in two parts, the cut mouth, but zero blood. It's just so eerie and what has made this case very famous. The LAPD and other agencies launched a large-scale investigation interviewing more than 150 potential suspects. However, the case was complicated by the sensationalism surrounding it, leading to hundreds of false confessions and tips. There are some theories and suspects, though. One of these was Mark Hansen, a nightclub owner who knew Elizabeth. Hansen was considered a suspect due to his closeness with her. It's unclear how involved Hansen may have been, but he had reportedly made advances toward Short, which she had rebuffed. This led police to speculate that 
this could have been a possible motive. Another was Leslie Dillon, a bellhop. He emerged as a suspect because he had detailed knowledge of the crime, and investigators believed that he had a psychological motive for the murder. Also, another person of interest, to us at least, is Dr. George Hodel. George was a suspect in 1947. He was a prominent physician in L.A., and he was known for just being really, really smart. He had high intelligence, and he was also very charismatic. He was born in 1907. He excelled academically in his youth, so it was no surprise when he went on to attend medical school. He then became a very successful doctor specializing in sexually transmitted diseases. By the 1940s, he had a well-established, wealthy lifestyle in L.A. He had a large house in an affluent neighborhood. His home was actually designed by a renowned architect, Lloyd Wright, and that led to his home being a meeting place for various figures in the arts and entertainment industries. So it exposed him to some really important people for the time. Hodel's dark side became evident when he was accused of molesting his 14-year-old daughter, Tamar Hodel, in 1949. The charges led to a trial, but he was ultimately acquitted. The daughter alleged that her father had engaged in disturbing behavior, sometimes photographing her in compromising positions. The accusations would haunt Hodel's reputation, especially after the Black Dahlia murder case intensified. During this time, the Black Dahlia murder was cold. That was until 2003, when a retired LAPD detective, Steve Hodel, yes, the son of George, started to look into the case and his father's life. And he started noticing some interesting similarities. First, obviously, his father was a very, very good surgeon. Remember, Suzanne had been completely dismembered. And detectives believe that the killings must have been done by a surgeon or a butcher because of the precision. Someone would have to know about the human body or at least know how to cut it. Remember, the body was cut perfectly at the joints. Steve would end up finding photographs of a woman that he believed to be Elizabeth Short in his father's possession after he died. LAPD surveillance recording of George Hodel's home in 1950 allegedly capturing him making cryptic and incriminating statements such as, Suppose I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it. George Hodel frequently traveled between Chicago and L.A. in the 1940s, giving him access to the area where the lipstick killer murders occurred. Both the lipstick killer and the Black Dahlia's murderer displayed a cold, calculated approach and a flair for dramatic communication, further connecting the Black Dahlia to other murders. Suzanne was dismembered and her torso was cut apart. The Black Dahlia was cut into two pieces as well. Josephine Ross and Francis Brown, their bodies were believed to have been washed after they were killed. So was the Black Dahlia. All four killings were ones of rage. So Steve Hodel also would go on to post on his website that both Suzanne and Elizabeth were both cut between the second and third lumbar vertebrae on their lower backs. And this is apparently the only place on the human body that you can, I know this is morbid, but to bisect a human body without going through the bones. Which, what type of person would know that? Yeah. A so doctor. It's, a doctor. Yeah. It's and also crazy. the fact that it happened to both of them is like immediately, re- I mean, it's immediate red flags. Red flags. It's very weird. So it's pretty f- crazy and a pretty interesting coincidence. Steve Hodel would come out with a book called The Black Dahlia Avenger. And in this book, Steve accuses his own father, George, of murdering Elizabeth. And he lays out why he firmly believes his father is also the lipstick killer. However, there's really limited concrete evidence linking George directly to the lipstick killer murders. Despite all these questions, William Hirons is typically regarded as the lipstick killer. Since, William has been a model prisoner. He was the first prisoner to earn his four-year college degree. William has appealed his conviction many times until he passed away on March 5th, 2012, at the age of 83. I'm a firm believer that George Hodel was the one who killed the Black Dahlia. But can we even place him in Chicago during those times? I don't know if they have been able to 
say that he was there on the day that Suzanne was murdered, but they say that he frequently traveled back and forth. Honestly, not entirely convinced that Suzanne's murder is was related to the other two women. Yeah. I mean, this this theory, you have to like tie them all together or it doesn't work. And when we were talking about William Hirons being the killer, there was a lot of doubt to if all three of the murders, Francis Brown, Josephine Ross and Suzanne were even related at all. I mean, I think Josephine Ross and Francis Brown are connected, very similar, but I don't know if I see it connected to Suzanne. No, and then, I mean, the victims are completely different. And then with the Black Dahlia, I don't know, Suzanne's body wasn't drained of blood and, like, strategically, like, posed. You know what I mean? Right. I don't think it's George, but... But I do feel like there's a lot of coincidences. Yeah, I think that I would be way more inclined to believe that the Black Dahlia and Suzanne Degnan are connected. Just because of the vertebrae? thing yeah and i think that and just her the black dahlia like being displayed in two separate pieces is i know suzanne's body wasn't displayed per se but i mean i think that like separating her body into multiple parts it's kind of similar i don't know i don't know i mean if the one doctor in la knew about where exactly to go i'm sure there's some other doctors that do yeah, definitely. Because they didn't have they didn't have Google back then, so it's got to be someone who has some training. No, I definitely think so. I don't know. I just feel like I get what you guys are saying, but I also think that it's a very limited number of people that's going to know to do that or how to do that. What's mm-hmm. an update to today? Basically, the case is solved because William Hirons died and they're kind of just I mean he was appealing it and wanting people to relook at the case he maintained his innocence the whole time but then he passed away so the case of the lipstick killer for the murders of Josephine Francis and Suzanne are kind of kind of closed per se obviously we know the Black Dahlia is still an unsolved case But I don't know if it's ever going to lead to any answers with the lipstick killer. I mean, right now, there's nothing. I mean, when, what year was the latest update? Like, when did we, we haven't gotten shit on the Black Dahlia. Um, Mm -mm. That one's going to be, I think, I hope that in our lifetime, obviously, that that one's figured out. All of them. I hope they're all figured out in our lifetime. Me too. So that was part two of the lipstick killer and also a little bonus unsolved murder of the black dahlia or elizabeth short do you guys want to jump into overtime absolutely what if i said no then we would then i guess we were just done we wouldn't even say bye we would just we're done that's it okay bye 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 i'm kidding okay we can do it um, okay, so what I want to know is what is on your 2025 bingo card? Kylie okay. had a really great list. Yeah, Kylie, your list was like really good. A few of them I, I thought- was like really questionable about, but do you want to I- tell the public or do you not want to tell the public? I'll tell them because okay. when it happens, everyone will know that I'm a psychic. Okay. But my first prediction for 2025 is... The country singer, Zach Bryan, will have some sort of paternity suit, baby mama drama with a woman. And she's going to be out in like the middle of nowhere. Um, in like Nebraska or something. One of his fans. Yes. Um, one night stand. Yep. Okay. It's funny that you say that. You, it's funny that that was your number one because the reason that I asked you that is because I saw someone talking about their 2025 bingo card and it involved Zach Bryan. And I 100% was already thinking it in my head. And it was that Zach Bryan is going to date and or be seen with that redheaded girl on TikTok, Sophia La... LaCourt? Okay, yeah, Sophia LaCourt. I don't think I've ever seen this girl before. Really? 
she's kind of famous on TikTok because she's really good friends with Brad Mondo, the hair guy, if you know who that is. I just went down their rabbit hole for so long. It's just so weird. Anyways, she had drama with Brianna Chicken Fry, Brianna Chicken Fry, earlier this year. And now, since Brianna and Zach have broken up, she's making TikToks about, like, messaging Zach. Right. Oh, so she's a bitch. Yeah. Interesting. I also yeah. wouldn't want to be on Brianna's, like, bad side. Yeah, why would you even want to do that? I guess Brianna had, like, called her out on her podcast, Plan Brie, and then she made a bunch of TikToks about it. So, anyways, long story short... The redheaded girl and Brianna Chicken Fry have beef. And now that her and Zach are broken up, Sophia is like making these poking bitchy TikToks about her and Zach Bryan. So anyways, long story short, it's on my 2024 bingo card that Zach Bryan is such a messy individual that he would actually date Sophia or like hang out with her. I don't think there's anyone he wouldn't no. hang out with. Cameron is next to me right now and asked, um, do you think that he's going to have some banger songs after this? He already has released a little teaser. Like the day he announced their breakup, he released a song teaser. It's like just so funny to me, not for her, but just like funny to me that he's like, I'm so upset. Like we broke up. He posts this like long post and then he's like, got the truck back up and running. And then he's, he has more posts on his Instagram story than I've seen him post in a year. Okay. Kylie, number two on your list i think j-lo and mark anthony are gonna get back together wouldn't be surprised okay we don't need to talk long about that because we hate her so we've talked enough about (laughs) j-lo i think that the menendez brothers will get released in 2025 hope so kylie next one of my exes gets institutionalized or how about just like anybody from the podcast? One of their exes gets institutionalized. Um, well, you guys. Broader statistics. I have no exes that are going to be institutionalized, but I know both of y'all's exes that could be institutionalized. Spot on. I'm I'm siding more with Kylie's, but. Okay, next, Kylie. Um, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey will get surprise married in some like really weird small country we've never heard of that has like no paparazzi or internet. That's a good one. I could see I that. Think, yeah. I would also like to note that Cameron says they're going to break up and he thinks it's a publicity stunt. I could actually see them breaking up as well. I, don't know, I feel like they're like getting too deep now, guys. I know. Yeah. I think they're either going to break up or they're going to get married secretly like what Kylie just said. But I could see it either way, honestly. I, I mean, also think that there will be some kind of Justin Bieber scandal. I don't know what it will be. It may not be like a scandal. It may be like something sad, but there's just so much weird stuff going on with Justin. And I also think like the P. Diddy thing is a little odd. They were like very close. Something's, I just feel something. I think he was groomed by P. Diddy. Yeah. Just like a lot of people were. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know what it is, but I foresee something, like something gossipy with Justin Bieber. Thoughts and prayers to him. Peace and blessings. In a similar vein, my next thing on my bingo card is a P. Diddy, in quotation marks, suicide. I sent this text to you guys of my list, and afterwards, the jail he's at got raided, and they haven't said why yet. Wait, like oh, real? Weird. Like really did? Yeah, like the FBI raided, and I don't know what they're doing in the jail. Oh. Ooh, weird. Well, I think that you guys have really good predictions for your bingo cards for next year. I agree with most of them. Okay, well, I'm going to go make our bingo card. I got to go slide into Zach Bryan's DMs. And with that, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. If you like this episode, please leave us a review. We would really appreciate it. And also give us a follow on Instagram at Over My Dead Pod and on Spotify and YouTube and all the things. And we will see you next week with another case. Bye. 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 Bye.